Let's bring in Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's former FDA commissioner and a CNBC contributor, also a Pfizer board member. Uh, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, hopefully you got to hear, uh, hear her remarks. What would your response be? Well, look, I think it's a very productive move on the part of CVS. I think it probably reflects the fact that less of the uh, margin is going to be driven by how they contract with drug companies through their PBM and the rebates that get paid. Uh, and more of it may be through the pharmacy uh, channel. So by changing how they pay the pharmacies right now, it's really a move away from uh, focus on trying to make money from the, from the spread on drugs, rationalizing that, making it more transparent, and in charging a price that's tied to what the drugs actually cost. I think that this is going to provide some advantage to the pharmacy insofar as it is going to give consumers a more predictable experience at the pharmacy counter. They're going to know what the drugs cost rather than that being opaque, which it is often today. Right. I mean, this really feels like a very big moment. It's the, kind of the end of an era in some ways of this whole model of integrating the pharmacy benefit managers into the pharmacy experience. I think originally that was supposed to both lower costs and increase margins. It's probably flowed mostly to the parent companies. And yet the parent companies haven't actually done that well if you look at it as a result. So the consumer's upset. It's not like these companies have been great performers. You have new entrants like Mark Cuban who want to disrupt things. And does that feel like where this is all going? How different might the experience of buying a typical pharmacy drug be in a couple more years' time? Yeah, look, I think the writing was on the wall with respect to the complex formulas that are used to uh, try to determine what drugs cost at the pharmacy counter and also what they cost to the consumer and the health plans. Congress is stepping in to pass legislation that's going to erode some of the ability for the PBMs to make margin off of that. So I think CVS making the move to try to rationalize the formula that they use to try to uh, set reimbursement at the pharmacy counter, if that's going to translate into a more predictable experience for the consumer, consumer is going to have more insight into what drugs actually cost. And it's going to also help the pharmacies have more stability in their revenue. That's going to advantage the pharmacies, improve that experience at the expense of probably reducing some of the margin that they were making on the PBMs because it erodes some of the value of the contracting that they were doing there. Right. But that was going to happen anyway. So I think shifting the emphasis to trying to make the pharmacy a better experience was, was probably a smart move on their part. All right. Speaking of moving, uh, you know, drugs into the future, we're getting reports that the free version of ChatGPT gives some inaccurate or incomplete answers to drug-related questions. This was pharmacists at Long Island University. They're warning consumers should take the chatbot's responses to medical questions with a grain of salt, which seems like a fairly obvious conclusion to draw. But then I think about the way that I've been using it myself, and sometimes I do ask it. <laughs> ask it medical questions and uh you know maybe maybe it's a slippery slope here well look i think right now these large language models are better suited for formulating good questions rather than for formulating answers mm -hmm. the clinical the, the training sets that they're trained on aren't regulatory grade high grade clinical training sets and so the information that you get out is only as reliable as the information that they're they're looking at. And in a lot of cases, these these models, including ChatGPT, are looking at old information and especially drug information, drug side effect information changes very quickly. It's hard to know exactly where to go for the most update information. So I think the best way to use these models right now, if you want to use them in a clinical context, is they do help formulate good questions. And so you can get a pretty good differential diagnosis off of them if you put in a constellation of symptoms. Some things that they're going to give you back just make no sense clinically, but sometimes they have insights that you might not have thought of as a consumer or even as a physician. But I wouldn't rely on them for treatment advice. I certainly wouldn't rely on them for advice about drug side effects, drug interactions, things that you really need to be consulting your physician for. Yeah.